Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. You don't want to read chapter 1 and 2 to know more about the group? Never fear, here's a summary of our runners. Bite, the albino Asian decker. He also dabble in rigging. He's socially inept and doubles it down by being the greatest asshole in Seattle. He loves his older brother along with hating him for being gifted at everything. Short Fuse, the dwarf shaman worshipper of Dionysus. He's poor as fuck, smells of cheap booze, wears worn out clothes and he's a pretty nice guy. Always ready to help his community, one beer at a time. Dice, the elf infiltrator. She's a teenager assassin. Named Pepper and looking like the Pepper Pots from Iron Man, Armored Adventure, built like not. Batman, on a mission to kill her mentor and other targets. There's no backing out for her, since before leaving her her master poisoned his protege, and she's on a timer to kill him and get the antidote. She estimates that she still have less than a year. With luck, perhaps more. Wolfhound, the street Sammy. The orcish equivalent of Wolverine with rocket feet. Got a grudge against Apex and his gang the wild dogs, and he's ironically afraid of dogs. He's a badass that can't easily be taken down, and if he tells you he'll get your job done in 30 minutes, expect it complete and less than that. The team were hailed as heroes when they returned to the Baron's commune. When they came back they were surrounded by dozens of friendly faces, cheering them on, shaking their hands or even giving friendly hugs and kisses to Bite's horror of being touched by hobos. Before the Shadrunners took hope as their fixer, the place was only a refuge for those who wanted a place to be safe inside the biggest hellhole in Seattle. Somewhere they would be free of the gang wars, shakedowns from crooks, ravenous feral ghoul hordes and organ liggers kidnapping plots. Somewhere the people who have families but no hope for citizenship could start anew. Hope and her sons could provide some protection, yes. But even them were not enough to protect over 5,000 people. DR Smiles would operate on the people of the commune for cheap, yes. But even with all his resources there is a limit to what he could provide. But recently the mercenaries have brought so many blessings to the denizens of the commune. Starting with Nikos Galanis, Aka Short Fuse. He works tirelessly to better the world around him like working at the soup kitchen providing free healing magic and even overseeing the walls and other security measures surrounding their little part of town. Then there are his friends. They brought back Hope's daughter Moxie, which not only saved the commune, but also prevented Hope from losing another child. Also they sent a pretty gruesome warning to any would-be criminals in the vicinity to not mess with Hope's part of Seattle, otherwise you'll get some shadowrunners that will eliminate you in the next hour. Then they have created a solid partnership between the commune and the owner of the Temple of Dionysus, Damien Brennan, who just recently had hired two of Hope's sons as bouncers. Also unbeknownst to almost everyone, the Greek god's influence brought good luck to both parties. And that's not even taking into account the Iron Maidens, the sisters of Harvey Hunt, more commonly known as Wolfhound. Having a team of badass chromed Amazonians keeping the peace can dissuade most idiots from starting trouble. And now, being part of the group that won such prestigious event truly brought hope and happiness to those who have missed it in years. And even more to those who made bets on our team winning against all odds, those guys were particularly happy to see us. That night the whole commune celebrated. With the money that Hope and her children themselves won on the bets they bought supplies and all kinds of food. For once the soup kitchen cooked something fancier than soups, breads and sarcaphs. To the joy of everyone there. Short Fuse brought his whole cache of alcohol that he brews at his own quarters. He has so many homemade special beverages there, that anyone entering his home would see nothing but stacks of beers, and different mixes for drinks, or tools for making alcohol and any kind of spirits possible. Sometimes with the help of literal spirits. There was even some of them that were mixed with some of his special stash of drugs. Easy to say, most people attending the party won't remember the night. For the occasion, every runner invited their contacts for the festivities. Wolfhound brought Guilty the weapon dealer, and possibly biggest troll in the west coast. 
the fat bastard managed to chew down a chug full of gin mixed with pills and deep weed as if it was nothing, then went on to have adventures with magic critters that only he could see that were possibly not there. He also gave the children tons of fireworks to play with, but since he was too high to care some of us had to follow the kids and shut down the fires they were starting. Dice invited her only two contacts that she knows, which is a not. Gordon cop friend Chris White, and a mechanic named Hammer. The former just stood around minding his own business, pretty much uncomfortable being surrounded by hardened criminals and people who would love nothing to beat up a rent a cop to vent out their daily troubles if it were not for all the booze in their veins. The latter just went straight to the Ra's Roadmaster and spent most of the night fiddling with it. I think Dice and him had some sort of agreement that only he could modify her car, and she just won a race with a van upgraded by someone else. Bite's paranoia kicked in and he called the local mechanic to see if there was any funny business happening to our ride, but apparently everything was fine. Bite having no friends except for his brother found kindred spirits in his siblings friends, who have come to the party on board of their hastily repaired Mythbuster. They came to congratulate him on his performance, bring him celebratory pizzas and teaching him the ropes on how to be a great Shadowrunana. Yeah, they were not just 4RC4D's friends, but also his former Shadowrunning team. They were an all rigor and Decca team who had many successful missions in the past, but after the difficulty of each run's increase they decided to split and each do their own things. Except 4RC4D who was too arrogant and decided to pursue his career solo, before being picked up by another team. Byte felt a bit of recomfort hearing all the stories they had to tell, especially each one that retells how his bro made an epic fail or tried to unsuccessfully seduce a lady. Short Fuse didn't really had to do much to invite anyone since he lives with pretty much everyone he knows. But it, there was one girl that he wanted to spend the night with. Her name was Jeanne, and before you ask, yes she is 100% completely ripped off from Fate Apocrypha. She's one of my favorite wafers, okay? So she's an elf with godly charisma that most people think she's a dryad. She's purer than snow, to a point that it is almost insulting that she is forced to live amongst the people of the barons and she's also a mage and a kind soul. She's from the Christian Theurgy tradition and she is using all her powers to the benefit of the community, such as healing the sick and protect the perimeter of the commune. And unfortunately Short Fuse wasn't the only one having the idea to ask her out, as she was surrounded by dozens of admirers, and as gentle as she is she couldn't say no to any of them. She ended up being at the middle of the party, barely doing any dancing or other activities as to not provoke a civil war amongst the men of the barons. The party went on throughout the night without much incidents, if we're excluding a few of them like Guilty coming back from his magic trip riding a giant slug made of water and guns, carrying tons of six pack beers and opening fire to the skies along some fireworks. Or Wolf found having to juggle between his 21 sisters wanting to dance with him, with none of them taking no for an answer, each having their own dance style and songs, and him tripping over constantly to the amusement of everyone. In a desperate attempt to have fun without causing an incident Jan decided to do karaoke with the renter cop Chris White, which unfortunately earned him the ire of over 100 envious fans. After the festivities the whole team took a two week vacations. Short Fuse planned for a hostile takeover run of a brewery belonging to a criminal gang, Also, he could offer it to his god in the commune. Dice decided to do not. Batman stuff with her buddy not. Gordon. He was pretty thankful for the invitation to the celebration, but he was even more grateful for all the arrests he was able to do thanks to the anonymous tips he received from her. His superior was so happy he received a nice bonus for it, and hopefully sticking with the young teenager would eventually grant him a promotion. Byte went with the Mythbusters crew and learned all he could on the life of a Shadowrunner, especially the role of a Decker Rigger. He was barely listening, too happy he was to not be with dirty homeless people for a change and to be with his kind of people. Wolfhound was in a living hell. How does an orc with a titanium skeleton, wolverine claws and rocket for feet can end up in such a situation you may ask? Simple. It's all thanks to their hacker. You see the Iron Maidens managed to save up a bit of cash thanks to the bets they made during the race, even Kate Hunt had some new yens she hasn't managed to spend yet. And now with all that money they wanted to go shopping, 
and their poor older brother was the nominated to be the bags carrier. He had to carry clothing and accessories for 21 girls on a shopping spree, with the additional stress of not dropping anything and to not mix the bags in their contents, otherwise his family will fight over their belongings. After a while he did manage to have some free time for himself. The street samurai was pretty satisfied with his performance as a human meat grinder, but he also felt he could do better. Namely he was uncomfortable that during their last mission he had to depend on the dwarf shaman spirits and the boost and speed he gave the infiltrator. Which is why he decided to find himself a teacher so he could refine his murdery stabby stabby ways. He had asked Hope for tips on where to find a teacher worthy of him in the barrens. Unfortunately the last guy was an old blind orc that died years ago, and there weren't that many that can teach how to use sibilims effectively in Seattle. But after a bit of digging, the troll's daughter, Moxie, brought up a rumor that she's heard somewhere about a new master of the Sangawaya Sero who established himself in the barrens. The master settled himself inside an old abandoned skyscraper, connected to other skyscrapers throughout rope bridges, barely standing wielded metal bars and other contraptions not kid friendly. The streets around were in shambles, with some having pitfalls that led directly to nests of feral ghouls devil rats or goblins. Proximity mines and other kind of traps were installed near the entrance. Only thing that was lacking in basic security was a reinforced door. Instead it was only a bunch of planks halflessly installed at the porch. Inside the building it was another kind of world. While the street samurai was expecting a rundown aesthetic, or at least some graffitis and dust, it was instead decorated like a Japanese dojo. At the middle of the room was a young elf girl, between 10 to 13 years of age, sitting in traditional Japanese style. Perplexed, the orc approached the small child, intrigued as to why this runt was standing alone in such a place. Wolfhound, whatcha doing here kid? It's pretty dangerous here? Comma a little bit annoyed, that I am aware, yes. Wolfhound, impassive, shouldn't you go back to your parents then? Did they left you in care of the master? Comma increasingly peeved by the orc, you better shut your mouth if you know what's good for you. Wolfhound, still not getting it, oh, I get it. You're the master's daughter, or its pupil? Do you mind if we wait for him together? Comma angry at the street Sammy, I am the master and you yeah, better show respect to your elders in the future. The orc stood there for a minute, processing what the brat just told him until laughed out loud for much longer. The more time passed, the more frustrated the master was. Then the kid stood up, and Sibber Blades appeared out of her elbows and knuckles. This was Wolfhound's player's face when he realized the GM was trolling him by giving him a lowly mentor. So you have come to seek my teachings young one. Wolfhound, okay, first off what can you possibly teach me? Second you're the young one pip squeak. Well it seems I'll have to show you what I'm made of. Beware though, just as you will judge my abilities to teach you, I will in return judge your talent and skills. You better show more promise than the previous wannabes I had, the ghouls downstairs are becoming fat thanks to them. Wolfhound, don't let my prowess blind you, short stuff. The sounds of clashing could be heard that night throughout the barrens, along with the grunts of an infuriated orc who was getting his ass handed to him. No matter how many time he slashes and thrusts with his cyberspers, he never seemed to hit the mark. Whenever he seemed to get close the small girl made a backward flip, kicking his chin at the same time. And despite looking as fragile as a twig, she hit it hard. No doubt she had titanium bones too, or something similar. More frustratingly is that she never used her cyber weapons once, not ever to block an attack. She had the ever-increasing smug attitude of a predator toying with its prey, knowing full well that whatever it may do, it could never hope to escape. In turn it made the Sammy even more furious to be clowned on by a brat that's not even half his height. After a whole hour of chasing after a probuscent girl like some of Byte's online friends, the street samurai decided to give up, his morale thoroughly crushed. He has spent his whole life, from as early as he can remember, fighting anyone and everyone. And all of this only to be bested by this master. He was about to leave when the girl shouted out to him. Where do you think you're going, boy? Wolfhound, back home. I'm sick of you. Did I gave you permission? 
Wolfhound, did you give me what? Permission, boy. I said I fee those who disappointed me to the ghouls. Would you take your chance with them? Wolfhound, better them than you. And why is that? Wolfhound, because at least I won't feel like a complete failure when I tear them apart. True. But would you have learned anything after that? Wolfhound, to not mess with brats. Instantly after saying that he heard a metallic wham as the girl's hand came in contact with his skull. Then it was followed by mild pain, both to him and the young elf, one pressing his forehead and the other her palm. Is that all you retain of me whooping your ass for an hour? Wolfhound, to be fair you haven't thrown a punch back until now. How about your pride as a man? Wolfhound, ouch. Tauche. Here's my first lesson. There's is something to learn in everything, especially in defeat. You underestimated me because I have the body of a child, and that kind of mistake could have cost you your life. Wolfhound, noted. Second lesson, whatever you do there's always someone better than you. You are a fighter, so there's bound to be someone who trained more than you, who has better gear than you or that simply overwhelms you in pure strength hit alone. As a Shadrunner you must never lower your guard, because someone having one or more of those traits is bound to appear during your runs. Wolfhound, wait. I never told you I was a Shadrunner. Nope, but I did so you win the race. Lost quite a lot of cash because of you. Wolfhound, sorry for that. Don't be, it's all part of the game. Now I hope the whole experience has made you more humble. Wolfhound, yeah, it quite did. So, I wish you good luck on finding a big and manly guide to teach you what you need. You now have my blessing to leave without going through the ghouls first. Wolfhound, wait. Can you, hum? Wolfhound, can you, hum? Yes. Wolfhound, I want you as my master, I was wrong and you are badass. Can you teach me, please? Well I can't say no to an eager student such as yourself. And truth be told not much people are good enough for me, even less those who would accept the lessons of Somon. Like me. Say what kid, from now on I'm your master. I'll teach you and only you, and I'll devote all of myself to make you one of the best warrior Seattle's ever seen. Are you cool with that? Wolfhound, yes. Master, say yes, master. Wolfhound, yes, master. And that's how Wolfhound got himself his own master, though less impressive that he had hoped at first he did become happy with his new mentor. And he will need those lessons for the next challenge that awaits him. The street Sammy and the gang were going to do one of their most difficult missions yet. A task so grilling, that only madmen would even think of taking it. In less than 3 days would be Bite's birthday. Bite's birthday is the 30th of October and he pretty much hates the fact that his anniversary is followed by an holiday. But this time it would be different, since all the members of the team got a special run given to them by a mysterious client named 4RC4D, Bite hasn't told anyone about his brother's Shadowrunner's name by that point. The mission is divided into multiple steps. Acquire the birthday cake at the Kakari. Get the presents at the presents factory. Rob a grocery store of all their candies. All those tasks sounded highly suspicious and sure to be some kind of trap, but the following the completion of the run was a reward of 40k new yens. Only to celebrate someone's birthday. The team though that whoever hired them, either like bite a lot, or is particularly sadistic to send him and his friends on such a dubious run during this special day. So everyone was prepped for the big mission, except for bite who was kinda morose. He was told that this mission was to recover items for a rich corpse kid birthday. And he actually bought it. Well he was only told the first and second objective, so it might have helped, I don't know. The group decided to get the presents first, because they got a feeling they will get a lot of heat from the grocery robbing and getting the cake might be risky if said heat might ruin the dessert. So with low expectation in their hearts the group headed for the presents factory. Situated near at the docks where there were loads of containers. Inside the docks were drones. Dozens of them. Some carrying crates, some overseeing the work, and other heavily armed for security. Nearly all the work was automated, except for a few guards standing around and a few workers operating a crane. This part of the docks belonged to Wuxing, one of the Big Ten Corps. Strangely enough, 
Everyone, drones too, were wearing party hats. None of them were celebrating something, and no one was happy at all. They were all working as if it was another Tuesday for them. To everyone's complete surprise, Byte stood out of the hiding spot the team was him and slowly walked up to the security guards. Even them seemed to be surprised someone was stupid enough to sneak in their private property and the simply go and talk to the guards. Byte, hey yo, corpo. We're here for the presents. Guards, dumbfounded, presents? Byte, yeah, for the birthday party? Guards, pointing their guns at Byte, birthday party? Byte, and sure, yeah, ain't that why everyone's wearing party hats? Guards, what party hats? Sir, we'll take you in for questioning. Byte gave us this look when the guards closed in on him to arrest him. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Bite, you told me it was for some rich kid. Short fuse, how could we know the client mind washed everyone into wearing party hats? Dice, and even hacked the drones to wear them too. That 4RC4D is such a gigantic. Wolfhound, fuck. The street samurai just received an impact from a huge cargo lifting drone. Its punch cut his breath away and sent him flying over a dozen meters away. What's worse, is that it was singing https colon slash slash www. YouTube. Com watch? V equals Q5 and sat repeatedly, making it look like the drone was having a stroke. On the side the shaman and the infiltrator were both dealing with the meat type of security, one flinging mana ball spells at them and the other with her pepper grenades. Bite, wait did you just say 4RC4D? Also, do you need help big guy? Wolfhound, nah, I'm good. Take this you bastard. Bite, what about you guys? Dyson short fuse, we can handle it. Bite, what am I supposed to do? Dice. How about you aim at those things? When the fight started some of the drones stopped their work, and decided to pick up their own packages. Gift wrapped packages. Equipped with his sidearm, the decker went to take down the gift carrying drones. Or rather he tried, then realized he can't aim for shit, and then went on using his cyber deck to take down the drones. In cyberspace you could see the Wuxing logo chained to a giant birthday cake. For the first time, Ray Lau felt some kind of sadistic joy. Well he already felt that urge before, but never did it bring such happiness to him. It was because of Wuxing that him and his brother had to live in poverty. Because of them that he now struggled as a Shadowrunner. But now, because of his older bro's gift to him, he can now take one of the Big Ten corpse machinery on a ride. With a flick of his arms, Byte summoned hundreds of tiny, really hungry jaws, rocketing towards the cake and sinking their pointy teeth in, leaving behind a mess of completely ruined shipping docks empty of its valuable contents, its automated workforce in shambles, his non-automated one out of commission and with dick graphitis everywhere the team then went on their second objective. Robbing a grocery store of all its candies. For this task the team chose a Walmart. At first it went pretty easily. The runners stationed the van just near the entrance, then they sent Wolfhound and Dice to pick up bags and boxes of sweets to load up the car. After a few minutes some employees of the store went to meet the group and ask if they've bought the candies already. The dwarf assured, in all his usual joviality that they did not, in fact bought any of what they're taking, and don't intend to. The clerks just stood there awkwardly for a second and then returned to their section of the store. Then after a minute of loading the goods, the four mercenaries hear sirens in the distance. I haven't found a picture, but I remember a while back someone requested a Walmart strike team breaching into a building in the draw threads, and this reminded me of that part of the adventure. 
I'll skip the following police chase because we already did erase them adventure last chapter. Plus it's getting late so I'll move further into the story. The last part of the run was to recover the cake from the bakery. Which was just a regular bakery. 4RC40 put just to mess with us. Little Granny Gamain who was running the pink cream bakery almost had a heart attack when she saw a bunch of heavily armed shatteraners break into her store expecting a fight fight. She did get a second fright when minutes later policemen were interrogating her about those crazy lunatics who robbed a Walmart not far from there. Bite. So now what are we supposed to do? Wolfhound. Ain't got a clue. Dice. It's your B-Day after all. Also happy B-Day. Short Fuse. Can we contact the client? I mean 4RC4D? Bite. Knowing my brother, it'd be impossible to reach him. He calls you, not the other way around. Short Fuse. Then what do we do? Bite. We eat the cake? Dice. Who suddenly got excited. Oh. Oh. I got a better idea. How about we go party with the Mythbusters? They're your brother's friends. And you're too. Plus you won't have to celebrate with homeless people for your special day. Bite. With an assuring smirk. You know what, girl. I think it's the best idea you ever had. Well you guys certainly took your time. It was the leader of the group. Greek letter pirate. A 6 feet 2 Caucasian human rigger with an eye patch, With a glare that can turn your blood to ice. He towered over bite like a troll with a regular human. His appearance reminds me of Big Boss and Colonel Miles Quaritch from the Avatar movie. He had an obvious cyber arm that is almost two times the size of his other limbs, as well as a blue light coming from under his eye patch. No doubt a cybery that is rapidly scanning everything in case of eventual threats. Nothing less to say that he looked like a professional, a war veteran, a machine purely crafted to kick ass and chew bubblegums, and surely has dozens of successful runs under his belt. Comparing him to the team would be putting kindergartners next to a real man. And right then and there, he was wearing pick related. The leader guided the team inside the hideout, which was a reinforced garage with double the usual thickness of concrete for the walls. It also had isers, alarms, cameras and all kind of other goodies you'd find in a James Bond movie. That is, if your typical Bond villain decided to settle in downtown Seattle. Operating on the Mythbuster was a troll in a dirty tank top and jeans lifting tires, as well as two dwarfs that seemed to be in a heated argument. When the group went to meet them they seemed to have reached the point of old married couples that has been fighting for over 30 years. I'm telling you, you need to replace the motor. Here you go again. It's doing just fine. It just needs some loving and care. We nearly fell off a cliff because of it. But we didn't. Yeah, but it nearly died during a chase. But it didn't. You wouldn't say that if we got caught. If we got caught we wouldn't be saying anything at all. Why don't you call a real mechanic already? And why don't you understand I'm not made of cash, hell. Greek letter pirate, here's codbreaker, decker when everything's nice, and plan B when it's not. The two ladies fighting each other are Ench and M00N. Don't mind them. Since the race we had troubles with the Olmeth Buster. You guys went ape on it, and dear wrenches and poor softy with her gear, so she's resisting the idea of tuning it. She'll come around. Eventually. Now, all we are missing is Jim Freak. In a minute boss. The voice came from upstairs, where a training area and a boxing ring has been installed. In the middle of it was an orc, a really big orc. To a point he shames Wolfhound in terms of being big and muscly, sparring with an Raz duelist drone, dodging and parrying its blade arms with brass knuckles, one with pain and the other train written on them. Greek letter pirate, yeah, he's the guy we got to replace 4RC4D when he left. Might be stupid, but part of our brand as a team is we're all gadgets and hacking like, and that meathead over here was pure muscle. Excluding the brain. Jim Freak, boy. Don't say that boss, I'm useful too. I got them sisters out of trouble earlier, now. And I can play with yeah toys like the other kids too. Greek letter pirate, yeah, but you only took one drone, that you barely use on missions by the way, and the only thing you do with it sea train. Look I ain't in a mood for that, so why don't you grab the party hats, hand it to everyone, and we start the fiesta? Jim Freak, 
You got it, boss. The party went on great. Inside the presents were cred sticks each containing between 100 and 1000 nullions, with notes like here's for a new TV, use this for kitchen appliances and sorry for taking that retro game console you liked, hope this makes up for it. Byte was a bit miffed that the gifts from his brother were only to reimburse what he took during his escape from whatever shadowy group wanted him, but thinking about having a free pass to wreck some of Wuxing's property quickly erased such thought. The Mythbusters gang and their case brought a by drone for the Decker. It was a small albino rabbit, with advanced implants used to store data and to allow its owner to share the creature's senses with. Apparently during their previous run inside a high-ranked corpo's house they received 4RC4D's message about Byte's birthday, so they nabbed the first thing they found as a gift. They also made sure that the pet wouldn't be traceable and that any dangerous data it may contain has been copied sold to the highest bidder and then wiped out. Byte decided to call it Sir Fluffs a lot, and it quickly became his best friend. The cake was pretty nice too, it was strawberry and vanilla flavored and it was almost as tall as a wedding cake. Codabreaker took at least a whole fifth of it by himself, then Jim Freak decided to start a competition of who can eat the most cake in a minute. Almost everyone dropped out except for Wolfhound, Dice and the Dwarfs. The infiltrator was the first to give up, the player having poor rolls on his body rolls. At least she didn't made a critical glitch, that would have sucked if she threw up two runs in a row. Second to lose was M00N, quickly followed by her sister, and then by the shaman. The only people remaining were the two orcs. The competition was tough, both for the two participants and for the spectators watching them swallow that much frosted sweetness. Both the street Sams have a superior body that has been augmented beyond the normalcy of their kind, and neither of them was giving in. Wolfhound nearly threw up once or twice, but he managed to defeat Jim Freak with the help of an edge roll. He was paraded on the shoulders of the audience, while his adversary was lying on the floor drooling and making a vow to work out twice, if not thrice, as much to burn up those new calories. And it is on that high note that the party ended with the whole team making new friends and earning the respect of people who have been running the shadows for years longer. Unfortunately, a sort of anguish was starting to build up within the group. The four mercenaries each had their own goals in mind to accomplish, and for some of them, time was running out. And that will be all for me for today, this is the end of the chapter. Hope to see you all on the next one, coming soon but I don't know when. Chapter 6, A War on Two Fronts. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.